guys, this week I want to talk to you about joy. Uh, it's, it's just going to be our topic for the week. And as we kind of get into this and as we're just getting to learn each other a little bit, figure each other out, I kind of want to start you with this question. Maybe you've heard this phrase before, some things in life are worth fighting for. You've heard that before? Roman, have you heard that before? Yeah, you've heard it. Thanks for, thanks for your help. Great participation. Some things in life are worth fighting for. I don't know um, what it might be for you or not. I'm just curious. Like, Ashton, do you guys have like a, like a family like dessert that mom makes that you're like, if it's the last one, you'll throw punches to get that? Is there something in your house? Nothing. You got nothing. Man, that was, Roman, can you help? Like a cookie or something that your mom makes that you're just like, I want the last one. Huh? Something Hawaiian too. I don't know. What is it? What do you got? Uh, no. Nothing? Does anybody have anything in their house that's like a family dessert that you're like, if it's the last one, I really would fight over it? You're whispering. What is it? A cookie. Th- thank you. Was that so hard? It wasn't. What team are you? Yellow? I, I don't know the teams yet. It's another thousand points for hobbits. Just messing up the score. <laughs> okay. In my household, it, it would also be a, the chocolate chip cookie. Like, the last one, I mean, so much chocolatey goodness comes out of the oven, especially if we're getting close to the end. I mean, just, you just, you're going you're gonna to want that thing. You're fighting for it. I don't know what other things you're fighting for in your house. Maybe it's like breakfast time and you got a sibling and both of you pour that bowl of cereal and you go to the fridge and there's milk for one. Like who's getting it? You're fighting over that. Maybe you're fighting over who gets the bathroom in the morning. That can happen at my house. You're fighting over best seat on the couch. Who gets to pick the movie? I don't know. Do you guys fight over these things? Yeah, some of you, some of you, you're, you're with me. You're getting it. What things in life are worth fighting for? Maybe we fight over what's better, public school or homeschool, where we go to eat. Zippies, haven't been there yet, but I've driven by it several times. Really curious about that place. Is it, should I go or no? Yeah, some of you are, yeah. Zippies, Raising Canes, been there. Maybe those are just what we fight over. Where do we go? What do we do? What sport team do we think is better? What sport do we think is better? These are the things that people fight over. I find it interesting that most people in our world think that their personal happiness is number one. It's something worth fighting for. That kind of stuff that makes me happy personal happiness. I want to fight for that stuff. And and often, personal happiness is associated with the stuff, right? The best car, the best house, the right friends. As we get a little bit older, our world would say the perfect spouse, the right job, the respect they feel that they deserve. Basically, whatever's going to make you happy, that's number one. That's the stuff that I'm going to fight for. That's the stuff that I want to fight over. Our world embraces that. Are they right? Is that it? Is that what should consume our lives now in junior high and high school as we get closer to being, you know, an adult? Should I be chasing personal happiness? And what might that list look like for a teenager? For some of you, that might be like good grades. Not all of you, but for some of you, it might be that. Good grades or being good at at a sport, having maybe the right clothes to wear. For some of you, it might just be being in a relationship. Maybe it's being popular, but whatever it is, you get convinced that, that just like our world believes that those things in life are the things worth fighting for, popularity and possessions, we just start to connect that to our happiness, to our joy. And if I don't have that, I'm not going to be very happy. So crucial to understand that the problem with a lot of those things 
it really is often just us. A lot of those on that list are good things. A lot of the, that stuff on that list, it's, those aren't bad things, but we let those control us and consume us a little bit and dominate us. We get consumed with those desires in our thoughts and in our hearts, and that's when they become a problem. Let me add just kind of another question, another layer to this, not just a teenager, but how should a young Christian think about this question? Christian, somebody who believes the gospel, somebody who puts their faith and their trust in the reality that that Christ died for their sin, that that's been settled, that that deserved wrath has been paid for with God and, and they're wanting to repent of their sin, which just means they're, they're wanting to leave that old way of life, that, that's that way of, of sinning and doing things that God says not to and not doing what God says to do, to leave that behind and, and follow the Lord instead. If that's you, what, what should you be fighting for? Because maybe you've started to notice been a Christian for maybe a few months or a few years, but you're noticing that you know, sin is still a problem even though you're a Christian, you're being tempted by sin still. You recognize that you, you say stuff that you regret. You think stuff that you wish you didn't. You're doing stuff that you immediately wish you could take back. So even as a Christian, you you're struggling with, with sin, and not only that, but you have trials in your life, real trouble and real hardship. They're finding their way into your life, and, and joy that, that maybe you once had as a believer, it's, it's getting harder to hold on to. The joy that you had at first is kind of difficult to find, and sin's tempting you to lose joy you should have as a believer, and you're to fight for just the wrong things and life is coming at you and it's causing you to start to look for joy in other things other than other than Christ beginning to look for happiness in the world look for joy in other places so instead of your relationship with Jesus you begin to think more maybe about popularity and about possessions the joy that you had in the Lord is maybe growing a little bit distant and when we lose our, our joy that we're meant to have in Christ, here's the reality. Our joy in Him isn't what it should be, and we're going to be in really dangerous territory. When our joy in Christ isn't where it's supposed to be, we're going to stop growing spiritually. We're not going to be serving the Lord like we should be. We're not going to be maybe using our spiritual gifts like we should be in our church. We're not going to have the testimony that we should. Our, our light for the Lord is going to grow a little bit dim. When joy in the Lord is absent, the bottom line is this. We're not living the way that God intends for us to live. So joy and happiness, or whatever word you want to use, contentment, it's meant to be in the Lord, and that's going to be our topic, like I said, over the next few days. God's Word has so much to say about joy, and if you'll listen, it will change your life forever. So what should you be fighting for? You should fight for joy. You should fight for true joy, lasting joy, permanent joy that can be yours because of Christ. And listen, you guys, you're not going to find that level of joy in grades or sports or a car it's not in your closet it's not in a friendship it's not in a relationship hear me those things can give you a little bit of joy but not like the kind of joy that we can have in Christ God reminds us all over the Bible that it's a relationship with him and him alone that can give you a real joy that doesn't fade, that can give you a true joy that's permanent, that lasts. And that's what I want to show you this week. I want you to see this. And today, 
we're just going to start with sort of this first main part, the connection between real joy and our Savior, the, the connection between joy and Jesus. If you have your Bible, I just encourage you to start making your way to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to just kind of camp here all week, Philippians 3 and 4 a little bit. And while you turn there, let me just say this. If you're not saved, you're not going to have this kind of joy. You're not going to have the kind of joy that, that Christ offers. And if you are a Christian, sort of the emphasis of today is this. I want you to make sure that you're thinking right about your Savior, that you're thinking right about Christ. So are you fighting for the right things? I like to give a big idea of each sermon, so if you're taking notes, I would just encourage you to write this down as our main idea or big idea, not just any old joy, but joy in the Lord is something worth fighting for. That's our main idea. Joy in the Lord is something that's worth fighting for. We're just going to read the first few verses of chapter 3, and, and we'll start to get into this and see why this is true. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. God's Word says this, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. A Christian can be a joyful person. A Christian actually should be a, a joyful person. And they're joyful because of their relationship with Jesus. Joyful because they, they know the truth. A Christian should be someone who's characterized by, by joy, by having joy in their life, by being joyful and joy-filled. They're that way because of what Christ has done on the cross. They know forgiveness. They know that they've been redeemed. They're made right with God. They're, they're no longer guilty, but now righteous before God. And, and that's pretty awesome. And that's a huge reason to, to have joy. This relationship that I have with my creator that's broken and into a trillion pieces is by sin. All that's made right, again, by what Christ did on the cross. And that's, again, like I said, a huge reason for joy. That's why Paul can say what he does in verse 1 of chapter 3. Rejoice in the Lord. And as we talk about joy today and this week, I want to point out the obvious, okay? The call to have joy in verse 1, it's, it's obvious, but Paul gives us more. He doesn't just say be joyful. He doesn't just give this direction to these Christians here in Philippi with no explanation. He tells them what to have joy in. And just to kind of give you a roadmap of what we're going to see this morning, he tells them what will rob them of joy in verse 2. He gives us his first warning, and we're going to look at a lot of warnings this week. And then Paul gives this great reminder of what's going to energize joy in verse 3. So I want you to walk out of here knowing that a Christian fights for joy, but I want you to know how to do that. We need to learn about how to be joyful, how to stay joyful, how to protect our joy, and all that's right here, okay? So verse 1 and kind of point number 1, this is a joy that's permanent. We're talking about a joy that's permanent. In other words, a Christian always has a reason to be joyful, and that reason never, ever changes. Verse 1 again, finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Paul's really given us an incredible look at the Christian life. He understands what it is to be a Christian. He, he's been talking about it throughout this entire letter. If we could go back and read it, we would learn so much about the Christian life. In fact, it's a book that I would strongly recommend that you read 
if you haven't before. It's so insightful and helpful. But just to kind of give you a few thoughts from chapter 1 into chapter 2, Paul talks about what it looks like to live like a Christian. He talks about what it is to live worthy of the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 27, he gives this sort of initial thought. This is how a believer lives. A believer has a new life and new goals and new desires. They're just not the same person they were before they came to faith. Now, a Christian is going to be concerned not just with himself, but with other people. And that's kind of where Paul starts in chapter 1. You're going to be mindful of all the people around you who don't know the gospel. You're going to be interested in sharing the gospel with them, with people outside the church. And then Paul immediately takes our focus to inside the church. And we can just even look in a room like this. We're from different churches. We've got so many different kinds of people and preferences and personalities. And there's so much that that makes us different. And yet Paul says, you know what? As As a Christian, living worthy of the gospel means you're concerned about unity. Like, I get that we're different, but we have one huge thing in common, and it's the gospel. We can be unified because of what Christ has done, and now our differences, they just don't seem as important. Because of what Christ has done, we can be unified, and Paul has a lot to say about that, and he moves into chapter 2, talking about how a Christian's really concerned about their spiritual growth. You can read about that in verse 12 and 13 of chapter 2. Christians care about that, and he details what spiritual growth is all about there, how to have it and and how to pursue it. Even exposes something that's really interesting, something that kind of wrecks our spiritual growth, and it's not what you would expect. It's complaining. Grumbling about everything is something that, that messes up our spiritual growth. Something that I I think these believers dealt with a lot, but what's so interesting, it's believers everywhere deal with that. Because of life, we're so tempted to grumble and complain about every little thing, and Paul says, you need to stop. That's messing up your spiritual growth, and it's hugely messing up your testimony to those who don't know Christ. So stop complaining. So Christians live in community with other believers, they live for the interests of Christ, they care about their spiritual growth, care about unity with one another, and now as we get to chapter 3, where we're at this morning, Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's kind of our way of sort of expecting, like, okay, Paul's wrapping up here. He's, he's close to being done. This is coming to a close, but As you can see, there's two more chapters left. Paul has way more to say. God knew that the Philippians needed more and weeding more. There's more to the Christian life. And what is that? And I think it's so important and it's so massive that we need these two chapters to understand it. It's that Christians also are to rejoice in the Lord. Christians are to have joy in Christ. It's actually commanded. That's what that word is there in chapter 3, verse 1. It's like an order. And you may be wondering, why would, why would God have to command me to be joyful? Why would he have to tell these believers and, and through his word, why do I get this command? And the answer is because there's, there's always going to be something that's trying to diminish that joy that you're supposed to have. And I want, you to, I want you to get that. I want you to understand that. There's always something trying to minimize the joy you're supposed to have in Christ. Something that's trying to, to extinguish it. Believers need to rejoice. They, they need real joy. And, and most of the joy in our life, I think we can admit, is circumstantial. And that's just a, sorry, a, just a big word that means it just depends on what's going on in our life at the moment. Like, I'm, my joy is connected to whether or not I'm having a good day. Good hair day, cool. Joy is high. Bad hair day, not so great. We just connect our joy to those things, what's happening in the moment. So easy to be joyful and, and happy when things are going our way. My family and I had an amazing day yesterday. I'll just give you the bookends. It started with donuts and ended with shave ice. 
course I had joy yesterday. <laughs> Don't judge me, by the way, either. A lot of sugar, high sugar intake. Of course it's a good day when days are like that, but not every day is going to be like that. So easy to be joyful when things are good, but what about when they're not? Surely Paul doesn't expect the Philippians to be joyful on bad days. Surely God doesn't expect that of us, right? Paul is actually calling these people, and God is is calling us as well as Christians. If you are a Christian, he's calling you to rejoice no matter what. No matter what your circumstances are like today, we are to have joy. These people in Philippi, they have real trouble. They're struggling financially. You could read about that in in chapter 4. They're barely making ends meet. They're being persecuted for their faith. You read about that in chapter 1. They're being socially rejected and persecuted. They have real trouble. They're being shunned and rejected. They're struggling to make ends meet. They have problems, problems that I think you and I can sort of relate to. Life isn't super easy for them right now, and Paul still calls for them to have joy. Not just fake joy. Not just, hey, it'd be great if you could put on a smile and just get through this. But real joy. Paul knows that their problems are real. God knows that their problems are big. And he knows the same about us. Our problems can be huge. They can beat us up and knock us around a little bit. They can make us even think, maybe this Christianity thing isn't worth it. But Paul knows, and we need to know this too, we have an even bigger reason to have joy, a bigger reason than the size of our problems. You don't have to pretend that nothing's wrong. You just need to remember that your relationship with with God far outweighs the biggest problems of your life. It's so much more important. Jesus is, is that big. Your problems, and they're real. But listen, they can't begin to compete with God. I know some of you have trouble. Some of those problems, they feel like they're as big as mountains. How can I possibly deal with this? How can you possibly call me to have joy, Pastor Jay, when my life is what it is? And the answer is because of who it is that Paul is calling you to have joy in. Rejoice not just in your personal circumstances. Rejoice in the Lord. That's a great verse to highlight or whatever you got, crayon or whatever you're using. Know that verse. You got mountainous problems. Paul says, have joy in the maker of mountains. It's it's so helpful here. Don't have joy in circumstances, not joy in the stuff that's going on, but joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, he says. Joy in the unmatched, unparalleled, unrivaled God. Christian has an incredible reason for joy, and it's a reason that never changes. It's so important that we get that. Your salvation, it's sealed, it's fixed. It can't be reversed or or undone. If you're a Christian, you belong to God, and there is nothing that can change that. Jesus wanted to make sure we understood that. He says in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, talking about believers, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Never. That's a huge reason to be joyful, isn't it? Despite the circumstances of my life, I can have joy in the Lord, and that joy is permanent. It's an unchanging joy. And and you see even the rest of verse 1, Paul says, to write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's it's a safeguard for you, or it's safe for you. He's just saying, I, I, could, I could tell you this all day. I could remind you of this hugely important, important part, point all day. I'd love to remind you of this. It's no trouble. You need to get this. It's not a waste of time. It, it matters. A young Christian needs to know they have a permanent reason for joy in the Lord. 
Fight for this joy. And how do we do that? How do we go about fighting for joy? Well, I think this is how to do it. Christians' joy is protected by thinking right about their Savior. That's point number two. We have to know the things that are, are going to potentially wreck our joy. And it starts with, with thinking right about our Savior. Our joy is protected, point two, by thinking right about our Savior. I might say it this way. Our joy is directly connected to what we know about Christ. The truth that we know about Jesus revealed to us in God's word. What we know and what we believe about our Savior, that will absolutely impact the joy that we have in him. Look at verse 2. You may be wondering, how does this connect? Verse 2 says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Your version may say mutilators of the flesh. Three times Paul says, beware or look out for. That's a a word that's used of something that's really dangerous. Watch out for this. Be aware of this. Like, don't let this take you by surprise. And it's not an it here, but a, a them. Paul's talking about false teachers. He calls them dogs evildoers, mutilators of the flesh. This is really harsh language, but it's precisely what they are. And these teachers are, are, are Judaizers. And you may say, what in the world is that? Judaizers, it's, it's a, a word describing Jewish followers of Jesus. And I can explain that a little bit better. It's these Jewish followers who are trying to add to the gospel. They believe in order to be accepted by God, not only do you need the gospel, but we got to add some stuff to it. we got to go back and sort of keep doing some of those Old Testament laws that God gave us to do. They believed that those rituals and those practices that God gave to his people way back at Mount Sinai, that those were still in place. I I, I could just simplify that a little bit. Here's what they were trying to say. Jesus is great. He's he's good. Yes, we're a fan of Jesus. You, You need Jesus. You need the gospel. But in order to really be saved, you also have to keep doing this Old Testament stuff. That's the only way you can actually be saved. And what does that mean? It it means they were trying to add works to the gospel. They were taking the gospel and saying, you need that, but you're also going to have to do your part. You're going to have to add to it. In short, that's just Jesus plus works. What Jesus did, but adding something to it, and Paul says these guys are dogs. They're evildoers. They're false teachers. Dog was a term used by God's people to normally describe Gentiles. Gentiles just means the godless, those that wanted nothing to do with God, had nothing to do with God. They called them dogs. It's not like, what's up, dog? It's different. It's a a, a horrible way to, to describe someone, okay? And it's hilarious because Paul uses their own term against them. He says that these False teachers, they are the dogs. They are the ones who are outside of God's love. They're outside of God's community. These men teaching this this lie, these guys are the dogs. They're workers of evil. It's an, an evil and wicked and confusing message. What's Paul getting at? Well, it's it's just about the dangers of false teaching. It's identifying the dangerous teaching that has you thinking, maybe Jesus isn't enough. Maybe I do need to do some more here. What's the problem? The problem is they're not teaching the truth about Jesus. They're not teaching the the truth about our Savior. Adding works to the gospel, listen you guys, it kills joy. It's going to kill your joy. This is the first, again, of many warnings that Paul's going to take us through this week. But this is where he starts. If you don't think right about Christ, 
your life is going to be void of joy. Why would that mess up our joy? Great question. Because now so much depends on you. Adding works to the gospel, it just requires that you put confidence in something that's weak, and that's you. Adding works to the gospel means you have to put confidence in something that can't actually provide you true joy. Again, that's you. It's confidence in your own flesh. That's what Paul's going to talk about. It's your own works. It's your own ability. You have to put trust and hope in your potential to, it, put it in their terms, to keep up with all these rituals. If we were going to try to put that in today's language, we would just say, am I doing enough to please God? Did I go to church enough? Did I pray enough? Did I read my Bible enough? Did I get enough Awana badges or whatever you guys do? Did I do enough? Did I go on enough missions trips? Did I come to conference enough? Did I do enough to keep God happy with me? And a life that's consumed by that sort of thinking is going to be one that has you so robbed of joy. Why? Because you're constantly worried about whether or not you're saved. Did I make it? Have I done enough? Am I, am I good with God? Yes or no? I don't know. I guess we'll just have to see what happens at the end. That is not the way God intends you to live. To live void of assurance is not what God wants for you. He wants you to know beyond a doubt if you're saved. He wants you to know beyond a doubt you can be confident in your standing with him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. We can't put trust in ourselves to be saved. We can't do that. We're not to trust in anything but Christ. Paul actually addressed this very issue of the Old Testament law in Galatians chapter 5. If you care about it, it's chapter 5 verses 2 through 6. And there he says, look, if you're going to add to the gospel specifically what these Judaizers were doing, if you're going to go back and say, no, 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 the Old Testament's still valid, it's still good, we need that, and we need the gospel, Paul says this in Galatians 5, if that's how you're going to roll, then Christ is no benefit to you. Galatians 5.2. If that's what you're going to believe, if that's how you're going to live, he says, now you're going to be under the obligation to keep the whole law, chapter 5, verse 3. Like, you stand no chance. Why, why would you do that? He says, if you do this, you're going to be severed from Christ. You're going to be fallen from grace, fallen from the very thing that's saved you, chapter 5, verse 4. And then he just tries to sum it up in verse 6 he says in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but it's faith working through love he's talking about faith in the gospel that's what matters this is a gift and this is what truly matters we're not to think for a moment that we can add or we should add anything to the gospel jesus is so enough what he did for you it's enough you don't have to add to it and listen again isn't that awesome isn't that a reason for joy i don't have to like earn this oh if we start to think that our salvation depends on us I think guaranteed we're just going to be robbed of, of the joy that we're meant to have. So busy, so consumed with worry and anxiety, wondering, have I done enough? It's a restless life. And again, it's just not how you're called to live as a Christian. So that's why the basics of the gospel are so important. That's why thinking the right way about our Savior matters so much. And it's a great way to just protect our joy. Again, this is just why we have to know what the Bible says and what it teaches. A Christian fights for joy by knowing the truth of God's Word, knowing the truth about Jesus. The Bible makes it clear. 
You're not meant to trust in anything other than the reality that Jesus alone can save you. It's Jesus who paid your debt, not you. Once you're saved, again, nothing to cast you out, nothing to undo it, nothing to cancel the debt that Christ paid for you. So a Christian fights for joy. They protect their joy by thinking right about their Savior. We're going to flush this out a little bit more this afternoon. But there's one other thing here in verse 3. How do we have joy? How do we fight for joy? I would just say it this way. Point number three, a, a Christian clings to their love for Jesus. Yeah, that works. A Christian clings to their love for Jesus. Or they're, they're aware of their love for Christ. They're, they're fighting for their love for the Lord. Not only do we protect our joy by knowing the truth, but we're going to grow in our joy by loving Christ more. Verse 3 says, For we're the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. You may be wondering, what's all that about? This is Paul's way of saying, Christian, this is who you are. You don't need the Old Testament rituals and practices. You don't need a temple to worship God anymore. You can worship him wherever you are. Those rituals were important. Now they're no longer important because they've been trumped by something far more important. And it's Christ and his death on the cross. You worship God through Jesus in spirit and truth. That's what Paul's getting at. We have access to God, the Father, through His Son. I mean, through Christ, we, we worship God. We can do that anywhere. We did that a few minutes ago and we were singing together. We're worshiping God right now as we are studying His Word together honoring Him and glorifying Him by, by digging into His Word. We don't need the rituals of the Old Testament any longer. It's absurd, isn't it, to think that we would ever put confidence in ourselves, that we would put confidence in our, our flesh. Don't do it. it it's, it's not what you can do. It's not what you can add to the gospel. You can't be a Christian and think that Jesus isn't enough. You can't be a Christian and think that you have to add something to his sacrifice, yet Paul's fear is that's what's happening. And I'll be honest, as a youth pastor for a long time, it's, it, it's, a, it's a, a real fear that a pastor has for those who are in his flock, those who he's shepherding, those who he's pastoring. That, that people would be led away from the truth about Christ and begin to minimize what Jesus did and put more confidence and more stock in what they're doing and how they're growing, how they're living. When we emphasize our works over what Jesus has done, it makes the miraculous mundane. It, it takes the divine acts of God and it just it makes them dull. takes the greatest source and energizer of joy and you just you make it weak and you make it defective when you start to put confidence in you and what you've done and everything just quickly becomes about you and not so much about Jesus. And when you do that, you know what? We're right back to where we started, back to only having joy when life's going good. Having joy only when things are going my way. So no matter what's going on, if you're a Christian, you should be able to say, you know what, this is hard, this is difficult, but at least I have Jesus. At least I know I'm right with the Lord. You may be in the fight of your life with some sin, but you know that Christ still loves you. You know there's nothing that can cast you out of that salvation might be in one of the darkest trials ever. But we know from this passage that you can have joy in your life because of where you stand with Christ. Joy is going to grow when you spend time with, 
with your Lord. It's going to increase when you study His Word, when you talk to Him in prayer. Listen, when you grow in your faith, your joy is going to grow right along with it. And as Christians, we have the ultimate reason to be joyful. And it's Jesus. And it's, it's Him alone. Rejoice in the Lord. Insist on it. Fight for it. It's worth fighting for. Let me just say this as we close. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, I, I can guarantee you, you're, you're looking for joy in all the wrong things. You're fighting for joy in things that can't actually give you joy. You're fighting for these little blips, these little temporary spouts of joy. And, and I know that they're real. When you get that thing that you've been saving up for, or that thing you've been asking for, or that thing you've been hoping for, or wishing for, and you finally get it, and it's like an amazing week. <laughs> and what happens? After a few days, a few weeks, maybe you can ride it out for a few months, that thing starts to lose the joy it once gave you. It fades. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's something you're doing. It's promising you this joy that it can't actually deliver on. Again, without Christ, you're looking for joy in all the wrong things. We're going to dig into the sort of the second half of this first part, which is verses 1 to 11. We'll do that after lunch. But here's where we're at today. To really fight for the joy you're meant to have, you must think right about your Savior. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for our time this morning. Father, I pray you'd help us to realize there's no real joy without you. As Christ said in John 15, he came to complete our joy, to make our joy full. And I pray you'd help us to understand that this morning, that you'd be with us today and this week as we study your word, as we look to this important truth about the joy we're meant to have in you. Father, there is joy unlike anything else in a right relationship with you. And I just... I want to begin our time by praying for any of these teens who don't know you. Father, who are, are looking for joy in this world. Father, as we read in, in Ephesians, would you, by your grace, by your mercy, by your love, would you save them? Open their hearts to your truth. And Father, those who are yours, those who, who do believe, who are following after you as Lord of their life, would you help them to grow in their joy in you? Help them to fight for it. Help them to truly rejoice in you, no matter what. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.